Welcome back to Learning Module 4. That we're going to be working on Chapter 5. And now we're going to talk about the shoulder joint. The last lecture we talked about the shoulder girdle, which was the scapula and the clavicle, according to the book. Now we're going to talk about the shoulder joint, which is in the glenoid fossa and the humerus that interacts with the glenoid fossa. So let's take a good look at the shoulder joint. It's attached to the axial skeleton via the clavicle at the SC joint. We look at that shoulder girdle, clavicle, and the SC joint is where the whole shoulder girdle is attached to along with the shoulder joint which is attached to the scapula. The scapula movement usually occurs with movement of the humerus as we talked about in learning module four that you can move the shoulder joint like move the arm you know throughout the through the glenoid fossa that shoulder joint movement with stabilization of the shoulder girdle. However, past a certain point, the shoulder girdle, the shoulder blade and the clavicle have to move the position, the glenoid fossa or this joint in the proper position so we could have um, efficient movement of the arm or the shoulder joint. And if you look at humeral flexion and abduction, we require scapula elevation, upper rotation and abduction. So if we look at that, Humeral flexion past a certain point requires the shoulder blade, as we raise our arm up overhead, the shoulder blade is going to elevate and upwardly rotate to position the socket in the right place. And it's the same thing with abduction. We can keep the shoulder blade stabilized as we raise our arm up, but past a certain point, it's going to upwardly rotate and elevate to position that socket. The same with abduction, adduction as well too. Once again, we talked about ab abduction as we come down to the side. If we look at this, our arms overhead, the shoulder blade is elevated and rotated up. As we come down, the shoulder blade is going to downly rotate and depress into the proper position. Now, scapular abduction occurs with humeral internal rotation and horizontal abduction. So what do we mean by that? As so we look at scapular abduction as it's moving away occurs with humeral internal rotation depending on what we're doing. Coming up here, rotating up, and a lot of times it will internally rotate. And what's internal rotation here? And if we come here, it internally rotates. So as we're coming up, it might internally rotate depending on the position of our arm. Now, scapular adduction occurs with the humeral, humeral external rotation. External rotation, if we come up here, Internal, external rotation. As we come up here, we might do internal rotation. As we come back down, it externally rotates to put it into the right position in the humeral, in the glenoid fossa. It's a wide range of motion at the shoulder joint and many different planes of motion. And that requires a significant amount of laxity or mobility. It's common to have a lot of instability problems at this particular joint. It's a very shallow joint, but it's built for mobility, not stability. We also get a lot of rotator cuff impingements because if we look at that, we're going to look at this later on as well too. We have four rotator cuff muscles, one on the top, two in the back, and one on the very front that cause internal external rotation depending on where the position of the arm is in multiple planes of motion. We have a lot of subluxations, which are dis partial dislocations and dislocations. We can have dislocation downward and forward. We don't get a lot of dislocations to the posterior side because of the way the position of the scapula is. If we actually look at the joint and look at where the position of this is, the way the scapula is, there's a little bit of, uh, it's, more, it's more turned forward this way. It's not straight up, if we look at this as the glenoid fossa, it's turned this way just a little bit. So if we look at where the humeral head is, what to put in the position of the arm and where it's at, there's not a lot of backward or posterior dislocation, but a lot of downward dislocation, inferior or forward anterior dislocations there. 
Now, once again, like I said, the price of mobility is stability. It's reduced stability. The only thing holding this together there are the ligaments that hold the shoulder joint in there and the rotator cuff muscles. The external or larger muscles cause movement, but the only thing that's really keeping the shoulder uh, joint together are the ligaments and the rotator cuffs. The more mobile a joint is, the less stable it is, and the more stable it is, the less mobile. Now we look at this with a lot like at the hip joint. It's a deep socket, but it does have a lot of mobility. But based on its structure, it's a lot more stable because it's more weight bearing. The shoulder joint isn't, isn't real weight bearing. But if you look at a lot of joints too, if there's a lot of muscle mass around there and it becomes more and more stable, with the connective tissue getting thicker and stronger, it might be less mobile, but the, the stability increases dramatically. Counter to this are gymnasts and weightlifters. If we look at gymnasts and weightlifters, they have great mobility, but they also are able to have great strength around this joint because doing these motions time after time after time, there's a specific amount of stretch on all the connective tissues surrounding this joint. So what happens is with the more stress and the more volume of training, the connective tissue gets thicker and stronger, which will create much more stability. However, if you keep doing that specific range of motion at each of those joints, then guess what? You, you, can keep the, you can keep the mobility, but the connective tissue will get a lot stronger, as will the muscles, to hold that joint in place. So we've seen a lot of people say, oh, weightlifting's bad because, you know, if you look at the knee joint, it's excessive range of motion and all that. However, if you look at a lot of weightlifters, their shoulder, their shoulder joints are very mobile but stable. Their hip joints are very mobile and stable, and so are their knees. They have, and weightlifters have some of the lowest uh, rates of knee injuries in the world, and they go through excessive range of motion and excessive loads. So once again, we have to look at the structure of the joint, how it's put together, how to train it, what the range of motion is, and how to train it accordingly through the full range of motion so it increases mobility and stability. So let's now look at the bones of the shoulder joint. Now the scapula, clavicle, and humerus all serve as attachments for, for uh, shoulder joint muscles. But we also need to look at specific landmarks on the scapula. So first of all is a supraspinosus fossa. It's right above the spine, supra superior, meaning above. Next one would be infraspinosus fossa, which means below the spine. Then we have the subscapular fossa. That would be on the other side. Actually, this is the, actually, if we're looking at Mr. Bones here from this position, this is where the scapula is at, so it would be in the anterior side. And this is where the uh, subscapularis, which one of the rotator muscles, cu rotator cuff muscles are attached to. Next, we would have the spine of the scapula. We have the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa. That's the actual joint itself. We have a coracoid process on the front part, that's the lower one. Then we have the chromium process, which is the upper one. Then we have the inferior angle. So all those are landmarks for, uh, for muscle attachments. Now the bones, the other bones, the other scapula, the clavicle humerus, serve as attachments. So let's look at the humerus. Humeral landmarks. We've got the head of the humerus. We have the greater tubercle up here. So this is the front. If we're looking at it from this point of view, the head, the greater tubercle, the lesser tubercle, the intertubecular inter inter groove right there. Actually, this is where the, the muscles will come through, but also, also for attachment points, specifically for the pec muscle, pec major, and also is where the lattice attached to along with the teres major. We have the deltoid tuberosity down here with the deltoid. Remember, it's a triangular shaped muscle, and it's got the anterior, medial, and posterior all attached to the same point.
again, more key bony landmarks are, you talked about the crumbing process from this side, if we're looking at it from a lateral view, the glenoid fossa, once again, the lateral border and the outside border. If we're looking at it this way, from this side, or from this side, the lateral border, which is facing outside. So if it's here, facing toward the lateral side. The inferior angle, which is the lower one, inferior meaning below. The medial border, that faces the midline of the body. And the superior angle, up here, at the very top. Then we have the spine of the scapula. Those are all landmarks for, for muscle attachments. Now, it's a multi, the, the ball and socket joint is a multi-axial ball and socket joint. That's the shoulder joint. Multi-axial. If we look at it from a mechanical point of view, but multi-axial, in other words, it can be in all three planes of motion and have all three axes of rotation as well too, and it also can cut across all those planes of motion. So if you look at that, that axis of rotation is going to change drastically. It's in arthroidal joint. And if we look at the inside of this joint, if we look at the scapula, look at it laterally, and look at the glenoid fossa. Around this glenoid fossa is a lip of cartilage called the glenoid labrum. And it slightly enhances the stability of this particular joint. But it's a lip of cartilage. It just surrounds this joint. So if we have this and that lipocardius, it kind of holds it in there. It keeps it a little more stable. Now, the ligaments that provide stability here are, they are especially if they're anterior. They're toward the front. If you look at this, they are toward the front. So we have the anterior, which is uh, to the front, and inferior as well. So we have above and below. So if you look here, the superior glenoid ligament, which is on top, and then we have the inferior glenoid ligament as well. We also have one in the middle. So, was, so we have superior, middle, and inferior ligaments. Ligaments are quite lax until extreme ranges of motion are carried out. So depending on, so right now, they're just kind of holding that, holding that bone into that socket. But as you go through specific ranges of motion or specific movement patterns, the ligaments will tighten up. So if we have up this way and do internal rotation, the ligaments are gonna tighten up depending on what position that bone is in. Now this is due to a wide range of motion involved at that particular joint. The stability is sacrificed to gain the mobility. So one of the, like I said, it's a very shallow socket held together by these ligaments, but the ligaments have to be a little bit lax because if you look at actual ligaments, they're 90% collagen, 10% elastin, and they need that for, they need to be able to lengthen a little bit or stretch a little bit for mobility reasons. Now let's look at this joint. We're not talking about, we're talking about the glenohumeral joint. We're not talking about full shoulder girdle movements. We're just talking about movement at this joint, you know, independent of the shoulder girdle, because we know the shoulder girdle, the scapula and the clavicle will move with that. But there are some positions in there that we can just have glenohumeral joint movement with independent of the scapula moving, it can be stabilized. So this is due to a company shoulder girdle movement. So we, like we said, we have some movements that, that are just at the, the shoulder joint movement, and that's what we're gonna look at. Remember, the glenohumeral joint only in, this, in these subsequent slides. Now, if we look at abduction, we go from here, standing in the fundamental position, if we look at that, if we do abduction, 
Now, that joint movement will be 90 to 95 degrees. Anything above that, like I said before, will cause scapular elevation and upward rotation. So this is in that frontal plane for abduction. It has zero degrees abduction because if we're here, if we're in that particular plane of motion, the frontal plane, it has no abduction unless we move it to the front and then it's about 75 degrees that we can move that glenoid humeral joint. So it's 90 to 95 degrees here without scapular movement. Abduction is to zero. We're starting at zero here at that. But if we move it anterior, we can move that joint about 75 degrees. Now, for extension, that's the back side. From zero here, we have about 40 to 60 degrees, depending on the person and what book you read, that we have 40 to 60 degrees of extension. We have 90 to 100 degrees flexion in that particular uh, plane of motion. So this is extension, this is flexion, decreasing the angle, it's about 90 degrees. And then anything above like 100, then we start to see elevation of the scapula. So we looked at some of the uh, examples that were given. And if you're, if you're a bodybuilder, they like to do a lot of front raises and stuff, and lateral raises to work the medial delts, to work the front delts. But if you could actually isolate that joint, that's called single joint movement, isolation of the joint not the muscles, all the muscles that, are, that have that caused that movement will be activated, especially the anterior fibers, depending on the orientation of the arm. But the shoulder girdle, the scapula, won't move. It'll stabilize and we can just have movement flexion at the shoulder joint with no movement of the, of the shoulder girdle. And it's about 100 to, 90 to 100 degrees. Now, once again, all these examples are just about the shoulder joint. All this, if we have full movement there, we can get almost 180 degrees, but look at where the shoulder girdle is moving. The shoulder blade will move to position that socket accordingly. But just at the joint movement, it's only about 90 to 100 degrees. Now, for internal and external rotation. For internal rotation from the neutral position, we can almost go 100 degrees. For external rotations, it's only about 70, depending on the person and what they're, if they have any injuries, if they have arthritis, if they have a lot of muscle mass, it's gonna be limited depending on you know, where the injury is set, for, is, is set at. If we're in this position, if we abduct the arm, we can go through the sagittal plane, that motion there, depending on the internal rotation there and the external rotation there, depending on that. Now for horizontal abduction, horizontal abduction, just at the shoulder joint, we have about 45 degrees, horizontal, horizontal abduction, right in there. Horizontal meaning the transverse plane, horizontal, with, you know, it's, it's parallel with the ground. Horizontal, horizontal abduction or transverse flexion, horizontal flexion, transverse adduction, whatever you want to call it. Now, for that, it's 135 degrees horizontal adduction and horizontal abduction from that position. Now, this joint is frequently injured due to its anatomical design. Remember, like we said, it's, not, it's a very shallow joint. It's built for mobility, not stability. We talked about the shallowness of the, of the glenoid fossa. It's a very shallow joint. It's not like the hip joint. It looks like a, a big, like a ball that's cut halfway through, so there's a lot of depth in there. The glenoid fossa has very little depth. 
We also have to look at the laxity of the ligamentous structures. They're built for mobility, not stability. The lack of, and we also have to look at the lack of strength and endurance in these muscles. That's why they have to be trained accordingly. We gave the examples of gymnasts and weightlifters. They can go through that full range of motion. However, the more movements, the more the movements they perform there through the full range of motion, it will strengthen all the muscles that help cause that motion as well too. Rebuild the connective tissue network to increase the thickness and size of those uh, tissues to make them more stable, but also able to, but it's also able to give them that range of motion they need. Now the anterior, anterior, inferior glenohumeral subluxations and dislocations are common. The anterior, it's going to, it can uh, dislocate forward and uh, inferiorly. So it goes down, and you can push it down, and it'll, it'll dislocate. It'll also dislocate forward or anteriorly a lot more than posteriorly. That's because of the structure of this joint. Now I also want to talk about if we have to have the proper training for this particular joint. Going overhead is not bad unless it's trained properly through its full range of motion and the subsequent little muscles can be trained as well too, along with not only their maximum strength, but their strength endurance as well too. In other words, to be able to create force time after time after time without any undue fatigue. That's in another class, but you have to realize there's different types of strength to be able to train all this connective tissue and muscle being connective tissue to help stabilize this joint and make it to be able to go through its full range of motion and not get dislocated. Like I said, posterior dislocations are very rare for this particular type of joint. Posterior instability problems are somewhat common, but not as much as anteriorly. Now, the rotator cuff is frequently injured. Remember, there are four, the only thing that really helps stabilize this particular joint are the four rotator cuffs. And they're very, very small muscles that cause abduction, um, inter, internal rotation, and external rotation. That's the only thing they really do. So they're very, very small muscles. They're attached to the shoulder joint itself they start their, uh, or they originate on the scapula and attach to the top part of the humerus. And the subscapularis, remember, the subscap is on the front side and attaches to the front part of the humeral head. The supraspinatus is attached to the top part of the scapula and attaches to the very top of the humeral head. The infraspinatus and teres major all both originate on the scapula and attach to the posterior side of, of the humerus. So once again, it causes external rotation, internal rotation, and abduction. As soon as we abduct, the, the um, supraspinatus will actually activate to pull it in and stabilize that particular joint and cause that motion upward. Attached to the front, top, and rear of the humeral head, which is what we just said. The point of insertion enables humeral rotation. So depending on where the, where the attachment is at, it'll cause rotation in this particular, in the, in the fossa. Like I said, if we do abduction, the supraspinatus will activate and pull this way to start to actually cause that with the first few degrees of abduction. Internal rotation on the front part, it's attached there to cause it to internally rotate. And if we look at the teres major and, and um, infraspinatus, they're attached on this side and on the back side, they'll cause external rotation. So once again, when we come up here and do that with our arms up this way, we can do internal and external rotation and still have this, the supraspinatus isn't really working because we have a different orientation of the arm. We can do that and then we can do external rotation and come overhead. So once again, you have to look at the orient insertions of all these muscles to see where, are, how are they working and in what position they're working in and what plane of motion they're working in.
The rotator cuff muscles are vital to maintain humeral head in correct approximation with the glenoid fossa. They keep it in this socket. While the more powerful muscles on the outside move the humerus through its wide range of motion. So we have the uh, rotator cuff muscles for stabilization to cause internal, external, and abduction. But the other muscles outside of that, like the lats, the teres major, the deltoid muscle, the pec muscle, can cause motion, the gross motor, the gross motor movements versus the stabilization movement, movements. So we have to look at the entire structure to see how it's being stabilized and held into that socket while the, while the larger muscles make the, more, the primary moves. Now, what's the, what's the GERD? Glenointernal rotation deficit. Now, the, it's the difference in the internal rotation range of motion between an individual's throwing and non-throwing arms. Most overhead athletes with a GERD of greater than less than 20% of a higher risk of injury, which means one side has less range of motion than the other one. Now, what we want to do on the tight side, we want to recommend certain stretching exercises to regain the internal rotation. So if you look at the one side that they use all the time versus the other one, the non-using side is probably going to have much more internal rotation because they're always throwing with one arm or whether it's a javelin or overhead press or some kind of internal rotation there. That's going to, the muscle's going to get tight because it's used a lot. So we have to make sure it's optimized. Now you want a, a little stronger and a little tighter to make sure it's stabilized, but if there's too much of a deficit, it could cause injury because it won't be able to go through that range of motion. It'll help improve performance and reduce the likelihood of injury because you want balance around that entire joint. And this is pairing the shoulder girdle muscles with their movement. So for abduction, the shoulder girdle, here's the shoulder joint for abduction, the shoulder girdle, upward rotation, Adduction, downward rotation, flexion, it's elevation, upward rotation. Once again, all these are about the shoulder joint movement as here, but once it gets past a certain point, the shoulder girdle will kick in to help position that socket in the right place. For extension, it's depression and downward rotation. Internal rotation, abduction, which means protraction, because we can do so much here, but if we want to go more, the shoulder blade is going to protract we can come in more. External rotation is the same thing, it's the opposite. We want to do external rotation and come back more. The shoulder blade is going to retract to position that socket in the right, in the right uh, point. Horizontal abduction versus horizontal, horizontal adduction. We have retraction and protraction. Now the glenohumeral joint is paired with the shoulder girdle to accomplish total shoulder range of motion. That's what we've been talking about this entire time. We have certain motions and certain range of motion at just the shoulder joint. But when we put the two together, we can get full range of motion out of that, and that's what the shoulder girdle is for, to position the socket in the right place so we can get full range of motion out of both. If we look at abduction, Go from up to 170, 170 to 180 degrees. But once again, we said the shoulder joint, when the shoulder blade is stabilized, the shoulder joint only has about 90 to 100, 90 to 95. Anything above that, the shoulder girdle is going to kick in to position that socket so we can achieve that full range of motion around the entire shoulder girdle which is one of the thing, reasons I said some books have the shoulder girdle as the clavicle, scapula, and humerus, because they all really do work together. You get about approximately 60 degrees of up, scapula upward rotation once you get past 95 degrees. You get 25 degrees of scapular elevation. So the scapula is going to rotate about 60 degrees. It's going to elevate about 25 degrees. Remember, that's that. Yeah, everything's based off the SC joint. In 95 degrees of glenohumeral abduction, what we just talked about. So you can see to get full movement there, 
We're going to need all these things to be in the, their, their optimal ranges of motion to accomplish this, this action. It's what they call scapulohumeral rhythm. It's not necessarily sequential action, but it's synergistic. They all will work together. It's generally accepted once you get past a certain point, when you're raising the arm up, once you get past a certain point, and once again, different textbooks have, have different, uh, different scapulohumeral rhythm uh, ratios. So some books say between 30 and 60 degrees of abduction, then the shoulder blade will move in a two to one or even a three to one ratio. As we come up here, once it gets past a certain point, for every two degrees here, of glenohumeral action, there's a one degree of scapular motion. So as this keeps moving up, the scapula is going to move in a two to one or three to one ratio. And actually, some books actually say once you get past 60 degrees up to here, it starts to move in a two to one ratio and past the glenohumeral's head's motion, past 95 degrees, it moves almost at a one to one ratio. Because every degree as we move here, the scapula has got to move as well to make sure the position of the socket is correct. It may vary within and between the individual. Once again, not everybody, everybody has the same parts, but how those parts work are based on a number of different variables about that joint.